obviously the 90s were about finding temperature maps and the naughty, as we like to call it, and then about polarization. And the next decade is going to be about something called B mode polarization. And just to kind of set the physics, and polarization is something that happens for a very simple reason. <coughs> when we have mass scattering, mass scattering surface, there's a very thin layer in time in which the photons go from being tightly coupled to being decoupled. The rapid mass scattering, they basically reflect. And as you know, reflection or scattering causes linear polarization of light. And if you have some kind of fluctuations in mass scattering surface, then this results in a net polarization. And because it's such a small uh, range in time, what's it actually doing this, the polarization is much weaker than temperature fluctuations. So it's been a lot more uh, tricky to find uh, exactly you know, what these things are. You probably have seen these beautiful things, Isabel, everyone <coughs> knows about Isabel. You yeah, must have seen the recently WMAP, you actually put the TT in here. So just to set the convention, TT actually means that when you talk about temperature, you're looking at two point correlations in the temperature. So TT is basically what people only talked about during the 90s. And this was the story during the 90s. If you look at polarization, which is basically now, what we've been looking around is, so there's actually two kinds of polarization, there's E and B field polarization. So some polarization is the gradient of something, some polarization is the curl of something. And it turns out that actually the polarization is much weaker, but this one is generated by density fluctuations, whereas density fluctuations don't generate B mode polarization. So gravity waves are things which produce a very specific kind of polarization, B mode polarization. And this is a choice method, therefore, for finding detections of gravity waves. Now, what actually happened with WMAP was these things basically propagate. There's a thing called TE and a thing called EE, which are the two point correlators with the T and E. And very interestingly, the first maps, the first WMAP results in the technical polarization via this TE. And the reason is very simple T is bigger than E. So, of course, TE is bigger than EE, which you know, are correlating to small things. If you correlate two big, big things with a small thing, you get a bigger signal. So this was initially found, but now we have found this one as well. So the big challenge now, so this is, a, I don't know what you call this, the 10 years or something, the 10 years or something. So the next 10 years, basically from Planck, presumably the next year onwards, is going to be about this guy, this CLBB. If we detect CLBB, we are actually detecting gravity waves. So the kind of this motivation for everything I'm about to say about quantum gravity is there's a very obvious elephant in the room at this point, which is which is what? So basically, anyone might ask, why is it that people don't look at TB or EB, and what's the reason for this? Do you know anything about polarization? It's basically parity. So the reason why these guys have been so all the, all the, everything is targeted upon this guy here. Because if you work out the parity properties of these various things, this is even, this is even, the B is odd. And if you have a theory which is parity invariant, you expect these guys to be zero. So when you go for gravity waves, when you go for B modes, polarization, you go for CLBB, and you ignore these guys. So if there were any kind of chirality, that is some asymmetry between right and left graviton in the micro in the gravitational wave background, then a very interesting thing would happen, which is these guys would not be zero. And you could end up with a situation where it reproduces the discovery of the E mode polarization by the TE. Because it could be the TB is bigger than this guy, yet again for the same reason, because you're correlating something big with something small. So the big proviso here is of course chirality. Is there any chirality? in your gravity theory, and this is the motivation for the rest of the talk. Um, the thing called the Eureze parameter in quantum gravity that really is begging for some kind of chirality. It's not very obvious in what sense this is true. If there is chirality, then basically this is the choice method for detecting both gravity waves and chirality at the same time in one go. So I'm sure there will be more about this uh, on Friday. And a very sad thing is that, of course, experimentalists assume as a prejudice that these things are zero. So they basically play with systematics until they are zero. They basically subtract things until they are zero and they say we don't have systematics. So if you basically, after a theory in which you say there is a signal in TB, 
you have to kind of review the analysis, but really, really, the, the dirty side of the analysis with a more open mind and basically assuming that probably there is a signal DB and you cannot just use that as a test for any kind of systematic error as well. Okay, so this is the background that um, I'm going to talk about. A few years ago, I wrote a paper with Lee and Carlo Contaldi with a picture which Stefan has already shown. I decided not to show any pictures. I'm very modest in this thing. But basically, we looked at the toy model for this kind of gravity. And this was a toy model not to be taken seriously. And the rest of the talk is basically work in progress about a serious theory. And if you look at some kind of, um, well, what was it, Pulpansky or Pleiadian, so and basically everything which has nothing to do with the real world. If you look at it, and if you look at the way the Nerezi parameter plays uh, a role there, you find that basically the Nerezi parameter introduces an asymmetry between anti-self-dual and self-dual, which are really aligned with right and left gravitons here, except there's no graviton, it's a toy model. So what you actually find is that if there is an Nerezi parameter in this toy model, you do have chirality in the microwave, in the, the, in the gravitational wave background. And in that case, what you find is that basically you renormalize the vacuum energy during the seeker phase, which is exactly how inflation produces these gravity waves. You have different zero point fluctuations for the right and the left. And this, of course, creates exactly this signal here. So this was not to be taken seriously, it was just a motivation. The big questions are the following. So what about this theory, okay? So the theory which is gr in minus plus plus plus, it's basically where we live. So the question is what happens there? Is the argument we used before reproducible here? But this would be a more realistic uh, derivation for chirality in the gravity wave background. And there's something else which is interesting. And I became very interested at this work with something called the Kodama state. If you want to look at inflation, and this is, ends this provocative title, Sleeping with the Enemy. A lot of people don't like inflation, and a lot of people think that perhaps quantum gravity is more tied in with DSR and things like varying speed of light. It could be that actually this is an ideal way to connect with cosmology, without stellar fields, without these horrible things we don't like about inflation. The Kodama state is just an ideal wave function for describing, not in metric space, but in connection space, what actually inflation is doing. And if you look at the Kodama state, I'll, this talk is going to be about the Kodama state essentially. There was a paper by Witten, so this must be serious, <laughs> uh, in which he showed that the Kodama state in the Yang Mills theory has this property. If you look at the, well, the equivalent of the graviton, you find the right and the left mover, the right and the left helicities, have opposite energies. So this is true in Yang Mills. Um, it's pretty obvious. Opposite what? Sorry. Opposite what? Uh, energy. So this was actually a damning argument. The implication was that the Kodama state is unstable. <coughs> At which point people said, oh, it must be wrong. Well, I'm a cosmologist. Whenever, whenever I find negative energies, yeah, this means life. It means <laughs> it means <laughs> and you'll see examples of that. You should never be worried about ghosts. Okay? But the important thing here about what Whitney shows is that this thing about positive and negative energies is an extreme example of chirality, of course. And even if this issue about reality conditions and what actually happens to the Kodama state in gravity kind of makes this more complicated. There might be a residual chirality there. And this chirality obviously feeds back into this argument, which is what we're trying to do. So this was like the motivation, so this is like the background. Let me tell you a bit about this. This is all going to be about Kodama state, reality conditions, and whether or not, once you finish up doing this job, the written argument survives in some form of asymmetry between right and left gravity in inflation. And this is not really inflation, it's inflation as it should be. So it's without stellar fields. Inflation based on an actual wave function of the universe, which is the Kodama state. Okay, so let me tell you what cosmologists do, and then tell you what the homework for you is, and um, what I have been doing so far. And my collaborator is really lazy, doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's all going to be work in progress. And I'll give you some clue. Luckily, you have another collaborator. Yeah, he's, he's much more useful than you are. <laughs> so, this is uh, actually, Lee said this was an exercise for a PhD student at some point. It's not, it's actually a very difficult problem. But we do have a PhD student involved in this now. He's doing better than that guy over there, he's the expert. Okay. But anyway, let's. Uh, 
let me tell you what the story is. First thing I'm going to do here is uh, just give you what the calculation is in cosmology. It's so simple, I'm going to spend five minutes doing it. It's very simple, very similar to what actually you do with scalar um, fluctuations. So if you've ever seen these uh, scalar fluctuations, the calculation for tensor is very simple. <laughs> so what you do is, and start from tomatoes and everything, this is a kind of typical calculation to in cosmology, which everyone actually does any quantum gravity, just raises the hands to the head. But basically, this is what you do. You do linearized theory around uh, the city background. Obviously, you want to shape the quadam state to see what this actually is. You want to do this properly. But you know, people don't know anything about quadam states or anything. And introduce this variable called V, which is basically something like an average over polarization states. You erase any dependence on polarization here. And you basically ask what is a Hamiltonian to second order. And the Hamiltonian to second order turns out to be this. So it's basically something with a kinetic term, something with a gradient term. And then in the sitter, there is actually a negative mass term. Okay? So yet again, ghosts, so learning about ghosts, there you are, this is a ghost, and um, this is why we're here, okay? There is a negative mass term in fluctuations around the sitter. This is called gravitational instability. Don't get worried about ghosts appearing in your theory, particularly something linearized. It doesn't mean any pathology. It just means the modes inside the horizon fluctuate. When you leave the horizon, there's an instability, but that's why the fluctuations grow. That's why the universe is not homogeneous and isotropic. And this, therefore, there are things which are not homogeneous and isotropic discussing the universe, okay? So this is nothing wrong, and so of course, this is why I never find these arguments very serious. Instability is a part and parcel of what happens when you expand, yeah? And plus, um, we, I mean, we should be calling from Witten's paper, he analyzed the Minkowski space, the, uh, this problem. Well, it's Yang Mill, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's Yang Mill, the Minkowski. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you call it a ghost and not a Tachyon? Sorry? Why do you call it a ghost and not a Tachyon? I mean, whatever the hell. People will call these things all kinds of things. So you mean negative mass square? Yeah, yeah, people just, I don't know, I don't have any problem with them. So essentially. Okay, let me tell you what happened. So the rest of the calculation follows, you just derive from these Hamiltonian equations of motion, and you find this very interesting thing, of course, as your mass term here. I know there's two things that can happen. You can look at modes. Remember, it is the sitter. Conformal time is negative and grows to zero. So the modulus decreases. So this is how we solve the horizon problem. We start with the modes inside the horizon. This guy dominates. So you just have oscillations. And you intelligently make sure that in this regime, put K here, you normalize it with 2K there. And you know why? It's because the unpunted field theory in Minkowski space-time tells me when I second quantize these guys, the amplitudes that were in front will indeed be creation and annihilation operators. Okay? So when I do this, I look at the equal time computation relations. These guys acquire the computation relations of creation and annihilation operators. However, of course, at some point the modes will leave the horizon, and then the mass term dominates. We become dominated by the gene's instability, so this goes like a power law. So there is actually a solution for this, which in this case is not too difficult to write. And this is what you get. If you don't believe me, just plug this back in there. This is your solution. And what you do, you basically promote these guys to second quantize operators. And you find this, the vacuum expectation value. That gives you V square, which is this guy square, times a number of operator plus the vacuum energy. So on the vacuum this is zero, this is just a constant. And you basically have to follow this function inside the horizon is what you, you know, in quantum field theory, in cosy space time. But in this case, this is the interesting thing. You leave the horizon, you get a factor of k in there. And this is where you get the result that this thing goes like k minus 3. This is the Harrison's of Dovish spectrum, which is actually valid as well for the gravitational wave background. So this is the calculation of inflation for the gravitational wave background. It's scaling invariant for this reason. It's just basically to do with the sitter. If you didn't have the sitter, if it was another space, the two here would be something else. You need to solve this in terms of Bessel functions. 
you still get the power law outside your eyes, and it's a different power. So that's all there is to it. Okay, throw two masters at me now. What's the problem with this? What's wrong with this? People are always criticizing this calculation in inflation. Isn't this just a standard calculation? I mean, yeah, and it's wrong. It is a standard calculation. So what's wrong with standard calculation? And interpretation is wrong for one. The what? Interpretation. What's the... Yeah. This is a problem. Interpretation in what sense? In that you are interpreting the uncertainty of the value of the fields in their vacuum as the actual size of stochastic fluctuation. So this is not general, it's just for the gravitational field. Of course. So there's one problem. The other one, which is probably related to yours, is why is the vacuum? How do you define the vacuum? Of course. And, but the other one, which is an even bigger elephant in the room, is that this thing is, of course, gravity. And you know what is the problem of quantizing gravity like this, isn't it? So this is all crap, basically. I mean, I think that's it. But it works. <laughs> OK, so the challenge now is to go back here. To go to the Kodama. The Kodama state is basically the, the ideal source, the ideal tool we really analyze all these things and see if we can address these issues. I'm glad that so Robin has, Brandler has a good word putting this, which is, I think what you're saying, the bunch Davies vacuum is the initial state, which is, in a sense, you can think of it as a perturbative vacuum state, but tr due to transplanting effects, you're going to get strong, you can get strong gravitational effects, so you really need a non-perturbative state. state. But you might actually say that none of this makes sense anyway. Even yeah, it doesn't make sense, I'm just getting that. So this works with nice, so people are very happy to you know, sweep under the carpet everything. Okay, so, so it's very easy to insult someone else without actually improving on what they do, which is basically what you just learned. I mean, the question is, can we improve on this? And, and what's the story, really? So this is homework. And I say that I have some partial results. Let's see if I get there. If I don't get there, don't worry, because it's just partial results anyway. Let me just write homework here. <laughs> this is the homework for people doing quantum gravity. We are not mathematicians, but they are physicists. Ten minutes. Mm -hmm. That's from the original one. You have twenty-five left. I was going to solve everything. <laughs> so, um, well, just very, very simplistically, there's two things which obviously should be done. One is very simple. It is an exercise for the student, and we really try to do it. And it's actually not trivial at all. It's just basically, you try to embed this calculation, cosmological perturbation theory, which is just completely standard, as you just said back there. But try to embed this into the hashtag formalism, for example. And I didn't understand. Can you repeat? Try to I didn't hear. Uh, what did you say? Try to re basically redo the calculation, uh -huh. which is textbook stuff, but within the context of the hashtag formalism. Because if you're going to try and connect quantum gravity, for example, in the formulation of Schlecker. First thing we have to do is understand the classical calculation. Well, obviously, there's a big equivalent. Okay. So what is mean is, first of all, we have to go Hamiltonian and Palatini, which is not trivial because you're basically looking at uh, metric and connection as independent variables, which means you're actually fluctuate independently. So there's no reason why the quantum theory is going to be the same. But classically, it should be the same. Okay. Famous last words. It's actually is a nightmare. To try and, for example, put self-dual connection and in Palatine and Hamiltonian and try to get exactly the same result, it's actually not easy at all. The main problem being that the reality condition, even before you look at the quantum theory, the reality conditions which appear here, and I'll explain exactly what format, the reality conditions are actually second class, which is the reason why people like to introduce them as part of the inner product of your Hilbert space. But it's very difficult to make sense of them. It's actually very difficult to make sense of them already classical. You get all kinds of contradictions. It has been a nightmare completely. So this easy problem for the student has become a nightmare. Okay? And I think it's actually a very technically a very difficult thing to get this calculation and just try to actually work out the actual formalism. You get the same result, but it's completely broken up. It's completely disintegrated into partial results, which in the end must be together and give you the same. And of course, the quantum mechanics will be different. Because, for example, the constraints are not imposed as operator constraints. They impose as conditions on the, on the Hilbert space. And the reality conditions are obviously imposed on the unit product. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which I think is perhaps even more interesting, this is kind of looks all right. It's basically try to understand the Kodama state. 
when you shake it. So this stuff, once you finish doing this, somehow this stuff has to fit inside the perturbation of the Padana state. And hopefully you will clear a lot of issues which are unclear here, like what is a vacuum of these various matters, even these old things, what the hell is this negative mass term, what am I doing there? Basically somehow this has to appear in there. And this is why I think it's probably interesting to go back to the beginning of inflation. People never, all these, these loopholes in inflation are not accidental. Historically they were there. Because inflation was never meant to stand alone. Inflation was meant to be uh, complemented by, by quantum gravity. But quantum gravity in Wheeler do it old style. So things like what is the vacuum, all these loose ends, what is actually the second quantized field theory, and more to the point, starting inflation, which is the other thing. Starting inflation was meant to actually be derived from quantum cosmology. And somehow this has been forgotten. Basically, there is no quantum cosmology, I'm not aware, but the thing is, um, Effectively, what you should do here is basically realize everything from the fact that there is one state without scalar fields or anything that is actually a wave function for inflation. Forget about the scalar fields, realize inflation from the point of view of the Kodama state. Let me just write the Kodama state. This is this beautiful thing. So this is the big difference with the old style. You're not looking at metrics. It's not a function in metrics, it's a function in connections. So it's in the Hubble parameter. Looking, discussing your wave function in terms of variables, which are not the, the old ones, they can't be because they're independent. Really. And you basically have a normalization thing, and then you end up with a shared assignment. Sure. And the big problem here has always been trying to find out what is the inner product in this Hilbert space. So if you shake the thing, what actually happens? Are these, things, are these states normalizable? Are they not normalizable? So effectively, what, what I'm proposing is to try and reanalyze all these loose ends in inflation from the point of view of the Kodata state, at the same time trying to bring, bring focus into the uncertainties into the Kodata state. There are basically issues about what is the inner product, what is normalized, is this normalized, and etc. So this is going to be essentially an exercise which is highly non-trivial in finding the inner product in this space and then um, exactly see where this fits in there. Let me just give you a few partial results because there's a lot of confusion out there. So I don't have an answer for you, but let me tell you a couple of things. So foremost, and this is quite embarrassing, people have been using completely the wrong expansions. But now we know the answer, so you can actually try to find what the expansions are. For example, there are papers in which the reality conditions, so the number of right gravitons, moving in this direction is to be the number of left gravitons moving in the opposite direction. <coughs> this is obviously nonsense. Okay? Because the reality condition cannot impose this. I can have a situation with just white gravitons moving in one direction, they're real, right? So, obviously something has gone wrong. So I think there are two problems here. First of all, you have to write things so that k and minus k are truly independent modes. And this means k is everything that moves in direction k minus k, everything that moves in direction minus k. This looks trivial, but it actually has a lot of mess in the literature. And remember, we really don't know what's right and left until we know the direction of motion. So it's very important that things are actually moving in the right direction that you think. Second thing, you have to include the negative energies. And before you do this, you get complete nonsense in your reality conditions and your inner products and everything. Let me just write what you actually get. So basically, this issue about chirality, which is going to appear here, is an issue about how do the self-dual and anti-self-dual modes align with right and left. And this is highly non-trivial, but what you find is that when you expand the metric, you find an integral in K, sum over polarizations, and you have your polarization tensor, then you have some kind of function, which you already know, because I know it from cosmological perturbation theory, so it's just this thing. And then you have your creation operators for the metric, okay? And then what you must do next is basically put negative energy, but make sure that the negative energy also moves in the same direction, which means basically taking the complex conjugate of these. And then taking the anti-graviton, so my plus and minus use graviton, anti-graviton, before I have reality conditions, there is an anti-graviton, and this guy is a diagram. So it's actually quite interesting to see what happens. So this whole issue, the paper we wrote ages ago, 
was essentially exploring the fact that there is a parameter creating a symmetry between self-dual and anti-self-dual. And when people said, well, the reality conditions kill that. But then you cannot say the reality conditions impose right and left parameters to appear in equal numbers. Because right is basically a real mode and left is a real mode as well. So I think there was a lot of confusion to do with these two things there. And if you just solve the Cartan equation, that's simple. And it's not very clear how you actually get the results in here, which is where we're stuck at the moment, or from there, for that matter. But basically, if you actually find what happens here, well, you basically have the same thing with the psi A here, so exactly the same story, the psi A there. Then you find something interesting. So this is the final result when you actually have worked everything out. You find a relation between, which comes from torsion with precondition, between the, the psi E functions and the psi A functions which appear in the connection. And let me write this in this form. And you basically find two things. There's a big difference between the modes which are inside the horizon and the modes which are outside the horizon. So when you're inside the horizon, basically dominated by this oscillating term, then you basically end up with something that gives you an IK as well. And you find the interesting result that the self-dual connection, which is complex, is made of real modes, the right and the left gravitons. So you get the left positive graviton and the right negative energy anti-graviton in the self-dual connection. And for anti-self-dual, you get the other degrees of freedom. So this is actually not surprising at all, because self-dual necessarily has got to be complex, and the right and left modes have got to be real. <coughs> so there's no way a reality condition yet to impose that your gravitational wave background had equal numbers of right and left gravitons. So this looks completely you know, trivial, and, it isn't, and in fact what is curious is that when you leave the horizon, you end up with this result, you actually scramble the modes. So you do have this division, Somehow, when you put negative frequencies into your expansion, you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence, but you kind of you have slots basically for the right and left gravitons and positive and negative frequencies for the self-dual and the self-dual connection. But you scramble this completely as soon as the modes leave the horizon. And this might seem like a trivial point, but this is basically the reason why, in some early calculations, any kind of chirality was erased. It was erased simply before because you know these two technical details have been overlooked completely. I'm not doing for time. Okay. So, well, once this has been done, then of course the issue is finally, and this is the last thing I'm going to tell you, how do you impose reality conditions once you've shaped? Could I ask one question here, sir? Yeah. You're working in Euclidean space, you said. No. No. Just Minkowski here. So we did this initially as a motivation in Euclidean space. But that is the Chern Simons is a phase there, or for you is a phase, or uh, no? This is the Chern Simons of this connection. Yeah, but it's a phase. Is a complex number, or uh, yeah, well, it's, a complex, it's a complex number. Well. Complex. Okay, so this is the homework. I tell you something about some elements here. It's absolutely not obvious at all how chirality fits in in the Ashtekar formalism. Mm -hmm. One of the crucial things is that when you talk about right and left gravitons, this is not self-dual and self-dual mode, and it's more complicated than what you might seem. Once you've done this, another thing about the field. So this might seem a trivial point, but let me just it's kind of late in the value, but the reality conditions, okay? So this is basically the big issue. Reality. It's going to be the big issue at some stage in assessing whether or not there is any chirality associated with the new easy parameter. And, of course, what you find here is that the reality conditions don't relate left gravitons in one direction and right gravitons in the opposite direction. With the expression I gave you before, this is what the reality condition tells you. It just tells you very obviously that the graviton and anti-graviton are the same. So this might look like a completely trivial point. There's a bunch of papers completely wrong, exactly because the expressions were not done properly. This is the obvious thing you should get. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem here is, of course, that at this stage, there is in a way that there are two types of particles before you impose the torsion free conditions. There's basically the connection particles and there's the metric particles, and somehow they become associated. And this is the big issue, of course, what happens when you look at the reality condition as imposed on the connection. So I'm not going to write it in terms of the 
the modes, I have the creation and annihilation operators, but they come from this expression. Now, if you look at the Poisson bracket of the theory, which relates E's and A's, so there's a sort of uncertainty principle between metric variables and connection variables. One thing that's obvious immediately is that this doesn't commit with E. But if these don't commit with A, this doesn't commit with this. And this is second class. So even try to understand within the perspective of the architecture formalism, all this comes about is absolutely non trivial in a complete mess. But more to the point, when you do the quantum theory, you don't even bother with that. What you try to do is work out the inner product on physical states as a way to actually impose these conditions. You make sure that your inner product, you guess the inner product so that when you look at the physical state, this is automatically enforced. <coughs> Now, this is a very clever way to do things, but if you play this trick, and we haven't done this yet in the city, but if you play this game in Minkowski, you find an asymmetry between the right and left graviton immediately. And in fact, you find the right graviton is unnormalizable, for example, and the left graviton is normalizable. So there are obviously issues here. When you dial in your easy parameter, there are going to be issues which are not as extreme as Witten's paper, but they really have some kind of asymmetry between right and left graviton, some mobility to the theory. So this is all work in progress. I blame my collaborators. It's not my fault at all. And I think one thing that you can probably guess out of all of these is that there will be some kind of, once you finish doing the calculation here, there will be some kind of asymmetry related to gamma and the TV. And the spectrum we computed ages ago, which was a bit naive, phenomenological, can probably be derived from the first case if you do this problem. So let me just finish with the big picture. I'm afraid I cannot give you the full answer to all the secrets of the universe. And I think the big picture is the following. I think people haven't quantized gravity because they're lazy. And I think it's, um, there is a certain sense that you're doing complicated things, from my point of view, as a cosmologist. There is this feeling that people are doing horribly complicated things. And like spin thumbs, blah, 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 all these credible things. They're doing mathematical theorems at the level of rigor that you just think, who cares about it? Okay. And at the same time, there is a very obvious way to do a very simple calculation that relates to things you observe. And if we have a microwave back if you have a gravitational wave background, most likely this will have been generated from an inflationary state, I call it the Seeger state. Okay? It's very difficult to generate gravity waves in varying state of light theories. It's very easy to generate scalar um, fluctuations with the right spectrum. But generating gravity waves is actually extremely difficult. So this could be inflation without scalar fields. It could be actually inflation done properly, but at the same time it could be the ideal place to test all these ideas about inner products. Because you bring actually focus into these issues. Focus coming directly from observation. So kind of the big picture in a way is very simple, and it's just, you have cosmological perturbation theory on one side, you have the Ashtaker formalism on the other. You have something no one likes, you know, someone with good taste likes called inflation, but you have the Kodama state. And this could be actually a better way to assess all these, these different issues. So there's these connections which I claim are not easy at all. But then of course the question once you finish doing all this is whether shaking the Kodama state, how do all these things live within a shaken, not stirred, <laughs> shaken Kodama state? Exactly what happens here. So the many, many loose ends which appear in the calculation in inflation, my mind can only be understood in this perspective. And the fascinating thing is, of course, that if you start looking at the Lirisi parameter here and at the chirality of all the modes that appear when you actually shape the Kodama state, most likely this is going to be the point where there is a novelty, a prediction, which is a TD component in the, the polarization. Thank you very much. I have a very naive question. I'm a little confused about your addressing the, the reality constraints and talking about um, the emitter parameter. I thought there is no, no such thing as a reality condition for real emitter parameters. No. So this is assuming complex in your parameter. That's true. That's okay. Right. So could you repeat the thing with the real one? Um, so that's a question I read with Martin, actually. Whether you could have chirality in the real yeah. in your easy parameter. I can't see how. He can see how. So maybe you should ask him. It's a kind of a classical formalism, so if you have... And anything you can do, basically, you can do a perfect polarization, you can do the mirror, but I guess if you really want to use the Kodama state, you, yeah. you only have the complex mirror. No, but there is, there is actually a generalization with the, yeah
hours. It's not yeah, no, right. So that's a good question. I mean, basically, there's a lot of stuff you could do. How is it that you get an excess of left versus right? <coughs> Sorry? How do you get an excess of left versus right right hand way? What breaks that? So effectively, it's the fact that the gravitational constant, which appears in front of the action for the right and the left, is different. So effectively, you just that. I mean, sorry, could you call that right versus left? I mean, could you have an increase of right versus? Left? You're imposing that there's a different constant for left and right yeah. anyway. So whatever you call that. So it's um, so. For example, if you do, if you actually find a Hamiltonian for this guy and this. You find the Hamiltonian is different, well, has different signs actually for right and left. So what actually is happening, at least what we guess is going to happen, and what happened in our toy model, is that the constant which appears in front is different. So it's not as extreme as positive or negative, but it's just different constants. So when you compute the vacuum expectation value, you get different amplitudes for right and left. And as you know, that's basically what sources TV when you compute the, the space. Lee had the question. Do you have a question? Oh, this is okay. Um, so, uh, one thing that I, I could be wrong, but that's possibly cool about this as well is normally in um, traditional scalar field driven inflation, we rely on some sort of tack, you know, a negative mass term anyway to kill inflation, right? So, um, but it seems that maybe one can rely on exactly this tachyonic um, instability for the gravitational wave. You're asking uh, difficult to kill inflation. Uh, so basically, one thing I didn't talk about at all because you know, I think first, first let's get this right. First yeah, let's of course, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's the question of the graceful exit. Yeah. So you actually exit from inflation in this kind of scenario. If you know that, if you have a scalar field, you know what to do. On the other hand, it's complete. It's a terrible way to do this. It's, it's not very graceful, basically. Um, well, here I have no idea. So basically, you're asking the question. Yeah, that negative mass term that always comes back and rises and kill. Yeah, we said, yeah. Uh, no, okay. I have a very simple question. So it seems to me that assuming that you work with the complex theory and that you start with the Kodama state, there are no free parameters. So you have an actual, if you do all the calculation, you have an actual prediction mm -hmm. of what this asymmetry should be. And in principle, one could, you know, if you yeah. don't see that, you ruled out. So what, I, so what I'm guessing you're going to get is that you do this properly and you're going to get extreme asymmetry and you rule it out. So then you have to redo this with a, a gamma which is not i or minus i. That's something, you know, to think. So in the, in, in the model we had, we actually had a constraint. You know, gamma bigger than 10,000 or whatever it was. Mm. So there's this kind of, um, but we haven't finished any calculation properly. This is premature. But then this other parameter appears in the black hole entropy calculation. Right, 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 right. So right. if there is a mismatch, I mean, you but need to know. be something and, and... We haven't done a calculation. So basically, we, we, we did have a phenomenological model, which I said should not be taken seriously. So we have to do this properly. First, with the self new connection, and the more general linear is the which is your free yeah. parameter. And then this should materialize at the end of the day, constraints, with one constraints on the other. And then there is this issue, whether this matches with the black hole it would be beautiful. I mean, basically, this would be the quantum gravity that have been discovered. You actually find exactly the same thing. <laughs> or kill. Or kill. <laughs> or kill, exactly. So, yes, we're going to go So, I'm not terribly familiar with the So what you do is, so first you do it, you do this, and then you shape this, and then the question is how does this fit inside it? Right. So then, but then you have these um, linear perturbations uh, for for those, and uh, those will be excitations on top of these. Uh, so it's essentially a fog uh, space uh, with that vacuum state. But somehow, the, somehow the inner product, which somehow is coming through all this story, this has to be normalized with the reality conditions as the inner product. Mm -hmm. You should mm -hmm. select what are the physical modes. So there could be chirality. 
predictions because of okay, so I just wanted to so just one thing you said loop loop okay so loop this is not loop of course I'm using the, the, the connection variable okay so there is actually a loop transform for this uh, I don't think so. <laughs> well so that's my only kind of caveat which 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 is, which is this level I would mention that is if somebody wants we can discuss it then. But is there, is a, there is a kind of loop representation for that, but it's not the standard one related to the Ashtakar Lewandowski measure and the Ashtakar Lewandowski product because there is a. On the other hand, the, the Plissian Minkowski, the loop representation of the graviton is essentially in actually identifying the inner product. Am I right? Yes. So, in a way, you better have some kind of loop representation for this and understand what you do. So let me understand a few more things. So uh, at least up to this part, uh, I see that I believe I understood what you were <coughs> saying. So then let me understand a couple of things. One is that you were mentioning also the Minkowski case as a simpler case to understand things. Does that mean that you can take the limit of the cosmological constant to zero and you still so there's a think are still well defined? Or when you were saying that, what did you mean really when you said uh, the Minkowski case? Uh, no, no, I didn't say Minkowski. I said, ah. the, mo I said the modes leave, the modes start inside the horizon. Yeah, that really? I understand. But I thought that you're not in Minkowski. You're always you're always oh, you're yeah, looking yeah. at fluctuations in the center, and some of them are inside the range. Yeah, no, that I understand. But I thought at some point you were referring to the Minkowski couple. Yeah, okay, so but then you, you, you can take just standing in front of the expression for the stage, but if you move from it, there's a one over lambda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, so yeah, you yeah. cannot take okay, lambda. Okay, so then I just try to take lambda to zero. You get a state right. which is which is morally a delta function of of something. And, and, and there are a few papers attempting to define that, but, but there are a lot of technical issues. So, so the, the whole, you, you can linearize general relativity around Minkowski space in the Ashtabar formalism and quantize it and study it and all of that is fine, but the, everything that starts from, from the Kodama state um, it does not have an analog in Minkowski space. Okay, so, so in, in the case of the zitter, though, when you have a positive cosmological constant, you, it seems that you can do it uh, properly for linearization, but the problem is that you cannot go beyond, uh, within, with this approach, but you cannot go beyond linearization. Is that a problem? You should be able to. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the, one of the big problems, as far as I understand, is that with loop functionality, <coughs> is uh, if you use the other approach, where rather than starting with the Kodama state and so on, is that they, once you introduce these spin networks and so on, is that it's very difficult for them to recover the semi-classical right. as far as I understand. It Whereas here, you start with this thing where it seems that you sort of naturally get this uh, semi-classical behavior. So the question is that uh, you start with linear perturbations, but perhaps the problem is that you cannot sort of climb up to the... Uh, can, I, can, I, can I comment? Mm -hmm. So first of all, there, there's a lot of recent results about um, getting the semi-classical general to the constant form model, so you can't just keep repeating it's hard to do something. Uh -huh. uh -huh. For example, um, Friedel um, and um, Florian Kanhadi have a bunch of interesting results. Um, the the Kadama state is a blessing and a curse, but the Kadama state is is the exponential of the Hamilton Jacobi function of the self dual solution. Sitter happens to be a self dual solution. Mm -hmm. okay. um, at the purely semi classical level, it has all the properties you would expect of a semi classical wave function. Um, except it's because of the reality conditions issue, it's the, their, their issue, the issues that I was talking about, they're, they're things that are hard to do correctly. Okay. But, but conceptually, it's just a semi classical wave function. So at the level of both semi classical quantum cosmology, it's the right thing to do with the exponential Jacobi function associated with the <coughs> space. The, the, the thing which is either a blessing or a curse is it happens that there's a procedure for ordering and regulating the Hamiltonian constraint such that it's an exact solution. And that's very confusing. Because normally you wouldn't expect something which is a semi-classical wave function also to be an exact wave function. And, there's a, and it may be that that's a spurious result. If that's a spurious result that doesn't negate anything that uh, was <coughs> which I was discussing, at least that's my view. Um, that and nowhere is I'm using the recent, the fact that there happens to be an ordering and regularization such that it's an exact solution. 
and it happens to be the Jewish search. And, and it may or may not be that that's the correct ordering and the correct regularization of the planet to be. But, but certainly, at the level of the semi-classical wave function, as was done conventionally a long time ago, you should be able to construct this, the, the linearized thing to around the sitter and construct the amplitude for the fluctuations around the semi-classical ground state, and that's what's been, that's what's been done. Okay, I believe we should, we have a discussion now, so let's start speaking again. Yeah?